what happens during World War II? Um, as you point out, obviously he's Jewish, he's gay. Um, I'm guessing that both of those things make him an enormous target for Nazis. Um, why does he stay in Germany? Yeah, it's one of the most fascinating parts of his story. You know, 1933 comes along and only two years earlier, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation has built this beautiful institute for him. He has designed the institute himself after a country manner that he admires. And he's on top of the scientific world. He's just won the Nobel Prize. And all his colleagues start to you know, flee his Jewish colleagues. They see what's coming and, and Warburg refuses to see it. You know, he's not gonna give up his kingdom uh, in Dahlem in, in Southwestern Berlin. He says, I was here before Hitler. And like a lot of Germans, he, he believed that the Nazi phenomenon would be short lived. Uh, his cousin, Max Warburg had said, you know, we just need to give Hitler enough rope to hang himself. So Warburg had said, you know, maybe six months a year, he thought they'd be gone. But I think that Part of it was, you know, he was so arrogant and so narcissistic that he, he couldn't fathom, you know, anybody telling him what to do, let alone, you know, he calls them Bavarian noisemakers. These Nazi thugs were going to kick him out of his institute. No way. I mean, that, that was his perspective. And I think the most shocking thing about his story is, you know, he, he has a famous Jewish name. His father's Jewish, so he's Jewish by the Nazi standards. He lives with his male partner. He should have been as vulnerable as anybody in Nazi Germany. And yet he not only you know, stays, but he provokes the Nazis. Uh, you know, he screams at them when they come to his institute, demanding Aryan descent forms. At one point he says he'll burn down his institute if they come again. He won't do the Hitler salute. He won't put up the Nazi flag. So, you know, he, he really was in a very dangerous situation. 1936, you know, the New York Times ran an article saying Warburg uh, may be in jeopardy. Uh, you know, he was famous enough at the time that um, they were writing about him in the Times. And, you know, he was also tremendously stubborn. You know, he said to his sister at one point that, you know, it's going to be either me or them. I'm not budging. And his sister's understanding of it was that, you know, the more, the more pressure he got, the more he insisted on staying because he couldn't, you know, stand to think that, that he would lose that battle. And it, it's very hard to understand this. You, when we look back, we see these Jewish scientists fleeing and we think, oh, you know, what wise, moral people. They saw what was coming and they left. They didn't want to be a part of it. But at the time, it was really considered a shameful thing that to leave was to accept that you were somehow a lesser German. And Warburg, you know, that was the antithesis of, of everything Warburg stood for, you know, to, to do anything that would cause him shame would, would be unimaginable. So there was really no way he was leaving. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.